I'm Mark Jardine, Managing Editor of SailWorld.com and YachtsAndYachting.com. Today, I'm chatting with Alan Davies, who's the Executive Vice President at B&G. Welcome, Alan. Hi, Mark. How are you? Very good, thanks. Great. Now, first of all, can you tell me, when did you join B&G? <laughs> That's a fairly topical comment right now, because I suspect I will be having my 25th anniversary in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> so, 24 years and... Ten and a half months or something. A so a quarter time. of a century. A quarter a of a century. Of a century. I love that old, right? <laughs> wow, yeah, that is a long time. Nineteen ninety-five. So in that time, you must have th seen things just really move on from what was, I guess, relatively basic instrumentation to what you have today. Yes. In fact, the uh, I was looking at it the other day. We're developing obviously things like chart plotters all the time. Um, and I have one down here on my desk, which I can't show you, sorry. Um, but the first chart plotter that we did at B&G when I was started was a CRT green screen, nine inch across, deeper than it was wide, uh, with an external card reader that read charts, which were basically you know, a resolution of about a quarter of a mile, I should think, really poor shoreline type stuff. So it's changed a lot, yes, no question. And now we can connect boats to the shore when we're sailing around the world and talk to people and connect to the systems and do whatever you want to do really so massive changes and so for our younger viewers a crt cathode ray tube <laughs> the old big domey tvs that your grandparents might still have had when you were born sort of thing cathode ray tube and yes. these were things you'd have to pack into a boat and you'd have needed a depth for a display like that and a battery to run it yes which was obviously significant no i guess the for those who don't know what they are old movies where you see old radars with the big green screen with the sweepy line that goes around that's the cathode ray tube and when you switch them off the screen shrinks into the middle and then disappears and you just end up with that little dot in the middle for a few seconds yes. so when your computer crashes today and you get a blue screen of death or something, the equivalent in the old days was your picture getting smaller and smaller until it became a green dot and then disappeared. So, and then wow, it took things, much longer to reboot. <laughs> things really have changed since those days. And on the software side, you've got, it, it's an interesting problem you've got because all the time this is developing, platforms are developing and how you create everything, just the hardware where you've suddenly got touch screens, you've got to develop for all of these changes. This must be quite a problem. Yes, and um, the problem is not developing, that's just a process. You know, building a touch screen in something, you look at it, you get the specifications you need, you look at the way you can build them and you go through the process. It's actually working out what the next step is that you have to build it. Um, and in our world, we're a little bit um, lucky in that we tend to follow the mainstream consumer electronics because our volumes tend to be much lower. So you know, we're not an Apple, we can't build an iPad, the first one out of the gate. Um, but when something like an iPad appears and everybody says touchscreen is the way forward, then you have to analyze that and go, well, is that the way forward in the marine industry? Is that going to work with water, with sunlight, with all those things, you know, as a sailor? In the old days, when I was selling keywords, I used to wear gloves um, when I was offshore. I don't anymore, but you know, gloves don't work with touchscreens. Waves running down touchscreens don't tend to work. So you have to either decide touchscreens aren't for the marine market, or you have to mitigate those impacts. And in reality, you mitigate the impacts because so many people want to use touchscreens. So, so there's some challenges there. And with the user interface, you must be trying to make things as familiar as possible to people who are now using mobile phones, iPads, touch screens the entire time. Yeah, and that's quite an interesting word, actually, because familiarity is the thing. When you actually look at something, even something like an iPhone, speaking as an Android user, um, an iPhone is not necessarily intuitive. You can't necessarily just pick one up and go, I know how it works. But things are so familiar. I mean, the classic example is that the photo app icon on the iPhone used to be a sunflower. Not sure whether it still is. It's not, what's that got to do with photos? It's, it is a photo, but it's a sunflower. To the extent that now, if you look at the Samsung Gallery app, it's a rendition of a sunflower in an icon. 
So it's a familiarity piece, which is not necessarily intuitive. And yes, with the move to touch screens recently, we actually have that same challenge. On a phone or on a tablet, this function is, you know, settings is a cog. So absolutely, our settings icon is a cog because that's what people use, are used to. So they go, it's a gear, it's a cog, it's a sprocket, whatever you want to call it, that must be the setting. And it is. So not necessarily intuitive, but absolutely familiar. Uh, and that is you know, user interfaces and user experience and how it all ties together across websites and apps and MFDs is one of the biggest challenges we have for sure. And is this based as you create new features and user interfaces, is this based on feedback from customers or is it you as a team who are deciding how the product is going to be developed and how you're going to present it? We'd like to take the credit, obviously. Um, it's, it is a mix. Um, and even the stuff that comes from our product management team, you can almost guarantee was developed from an idea that came from a consumer somewhere. Talking to someone, wouldn't it be great if you could X? And then you think, well, that's a silly idea. But then three years down the line, it's sort of grown through into, you can't X, but we can do that, which is based on the same idea and is a similar thing. So the, I mean, I've been product management for the last 10 years or so um, before this role. The biggest product management question is always why? A consumer or a, someone inside the company, a sales guy, someone will come and say, I want that to do that there. And they don't want that. They want to solve a problem. So why do you want to do that? And can I find a better way of solving that problem for you? Which might be a two day project rather than a two year project, which you just proposed to me. <laughs> so rather than looking at the this is what the customer says they want. You're looking actually at the problem they are trying yep. to solve and seeing yep. how you can solve it better. And, and one of the things that we do every now and again is we just put one of our user designers or our product managers on a boat and watch someone use the product. Because you learn so much. You know, the way I use our products and the way you might use one of our products is completely different to the way someone else does. Um, in a different world, I went out fishing in Miami area, Florida area last year, and I watched the guy use the product uh, from our partner sister brand, Simran, and the guy had it on one screen, looked at it, had the radar on, had the chart on, never touched a single button all day, wow. but had all the information he wanted on the screen at one time, whereas I am... Um, Probably like you, I'm always pressing buttons on things because I enjoy pressing buttons on things. So I don't, a very different way of looking at stuff. I don't um, know. I quite I quite like the whole idea of being able to see all of the information to hand. So maybe I'm different yeah. from you there, Alan. Maybe. And in, in, in the instrument world, which is sort of the background of where b and originally came from, that's absolutely what you want. You want hands off. You want the information provided to you. When you start to get into navigation and radar and things, you tend to want to interact a little bit more and see you know, who's that boat over there and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it changes. But observing the way different users use the equipment and not assuming that everybody uses it like you do is a really powerful um, tool. And this brings up the point, under Navico, your parent company, you have multiple brands um, with Laurent, Simrad, as you've just mentioned, and these are all aimed at different sectors of the marine market. Um, yep. This product crossover, do you have a, a base which it all works from that you have the similar hardware, but then create features for each of those separate brands? Yes and no. <laughs> In an ideal world, everything under the hood is the same as it were. Um, but we have a process of, um, we look at our product roadmap from the brand perspective. You know, B&G needs a new chart plot, a multifunction display, whatever you want to call it. Lorantz needs a similar one in a year's time. Simran wants one, but a little bit different. And we then look forward to there and go, well, to do all those things, we're going to need a new hardware platform. So we have what we call a technology building block in our roadmap and we develop that hardware platform or that you know, 
screen, touchscreen, bonded assembly, whatever it happens to be, and test all that in advance of doing any physical product development. And at that point, we have an underlying platform. We might have to do different PCB layouts, so the physical electronics might have to be different shapes and stuff. But the core software, the core processor and stuff is one of a smaller selection. Now, we don't have a different one for every product, obviously. That would be, uh, well, the complexity would drive us all insane for starters. Um, but it is one of the, you know, one of the harder pieces of having multiple brands in one um, company is that you have slightly differing needs. So you do get that internal tension between the brands. But one of the good things about it is you absolutely can say this product is focused at that customer and that customer doesn't want to know whether there's a marlin 10,000 feet below his boat or whatever. Um, he wants to go as fast as he possibly can in the sailing boat. You can absolutely focus the product and remove all that extraneous stuff that is not necessary. And it also means the people who work on that product are specialists on that application. They're the sailing guys, um, which makes a big difference, I think. So you have shared building blocks, really, for your products. Yes. But then when it gets to the specialities for each of the different sectors, that's where they diverge. That's right. And it varies. If you have something like a VHF, the difference between the B&G VHF and the Simrad VHF is the logo on it. There are no sailing features in a VHF. You know, everything you want to do to communicate with another boat is the same whether they're a power boat or a sailing boat. So it's just literally a brand match. Um, but you can go all the way to the other end and you can look at wind sensors or something like that. And the requirement for a wind sensor on a multi-hull or something is you know, half a degree accuracy would be nice. Um, whereas with a power boat, you're using wind to go, which way is the wind blowing me onto the dock when I come back at the end of the day? It's from the right. So plus or minus 10 degrees would it be absolutely fine. So there's a very, you know, it varies a lot. And if you're, you know, many of our products, AIS units and things, they're actually, we call them unbranded. They're a black box. We don't put B&G on the front. It's the same across the three brands. So you know, it's a generic part. But from the B&G perspective, instruments are very much specialist and the instrument sensors are very much specialist. And we spend a lot of time getting those right. The rest of the stuff tends to be software feature development for that market. And your own sailing. Um, we've seen you in various dinghy fleets, um, the B-14s a few years ago. And, nice. um, <laughs> okay, you've been around in B&G for 25 years and the B-14s have been around for a while. But Yep. So when I first started at B&G, I think I used the last of my student loan money to buy a Laser 4000 at the time. Um, and then five years after that, I bought a B-14. Uh, and stayed in that fleet off and on. Have had a few years out over the time uh, until last year, uh, and just sold my uh, last B14 to someone local to you, actually. It's a Limington boat now. So, um, but yes, I bought a moth mainly because the world's were in Garda a few years ago, and I love Garda. I've been going there a lot, um, which then got upgraded to another moth. Uh, which is sat in the garage awaiting the sailing season, um, which is unfortunate. In fact, 90% of it is in the garage waiting sailing season. There is definitely a run of foil down with Simon at the Maguire team um, awaiting me to collect it from the end of last season. So, uh, sorry, Simon. <laughs> so the rudder is in New Milton and um, your B14's gone to, New to Limington. Now. Yes, it's just coming down towards you, Mark. That's all it is. So, and yes, there's a... Uh, and there's an RS Aero in the RS sailing building in Romsey with my name on it. But that one also will have to wait until the sailing season starts at this point. So that's my, it's going to be a Wednesday evening boat, I think. Well, fingers Power crossed, Island. fingers crossed you can pick that up soon. And um, RS sailing used to be your neighbours. They were our next door neighbours in Romsey. Yes, it's true. <laughs> I forgot that. <laughs> yep, they were right next door to us. We could walk around at lunchtime and buy new string. I say string, so the Mar Marlow guys who are no doubt listening will get annoyed because it's high-tech cordage, obviously. But, uh, so yes, dinghy sailing has been limited to splicing over the last few months, unfortunately, which is not good when the weather is this good. 
Yeah, well, we've been running quite a few articles about the boat bimbling at the moment where people have been doing those upgrades on the boat. But yeah, when the weather's like this, it is just a tad frustrating that we're not out on the water. But in your role, um, do you think being a sailor is absolutely key? In the role I am in today, I could get away with being less of a sailor. But the role that I've come up through and the role that all my guys work in, you need to be a sailor. Or at least it's hugely helpful. You know, if we had a team which had no sailors on it, that would be a disaster. If we had a team which everybody was a sailor, then that would probably be good, but we might get a lack of, you know, it might be a little bit, we should just, just do this because that's what's cool. Um, so we have a nice balance at the moment. Um, on our projects, our product managers that work on BNG are all sailors. The product experts who are our sort of high tier support team are all sailors. Um, and many of our software engineers, probably on most of our projects, around 30 or 40 percent of the minimum, which across Navico, which is a 200 um, engineer company, probably in that sort of region, um, is a significant number. So we're lucky in that we have a good group of people um, who are competitive sailors, whether they are other moth sailors or whether they're cruising sailors or whatever. Um, our marketing guys, uh, you know Simon, he's a sailor. Um, many of our other marketing guys are sailors. So yeah, it's you couldn't run a sailing company without being a sailor. And that's for many reasons, but yeah, the application is clear. I said earlier, not everybody uses the products the way I use the products or the way someone else uses the products. But if you don't know how to sail a boat, you don't know how to design a product for anybody. So I, uh, every now and again, we bring someone new on board and we sort of give them a task which is sailing biased. And if they're not a sailor, they usually fall down flat because they overlook something obvious, like you can't sail a boat directly into the wind or something like that. You know? it's, uh, and it's only a little test. We don't actually make sure they do it. But, uh, but yes, it's the good thing is you can have sailing specialists and you can have application specialists. And those application specialists listen to the sailing guys because they trust them. Um, mm. So when we're specifying something, you can have someone on the development side that says, this is a really excellent way of doing something. And the sailing guy is saying, this is how the user needs to use it. And you sort of mash them together and find the best compromise of the two. And, you know, would I employ someone in the product management role in D&G who wasn't a sailor? No, no chance. Would I employ an R&D guy who wasn't a sailor? Absolutely. Would I prefer he was a sailor? Yes. <laughs> well, that pretty much answers the question. Yes, it is important, it, especially the role where you've come through the company from, from yeah, as you say, just at the end of um, university all the way through. It's, it's absolutely vital that you are a sailor. Sales guys, service guys, product management, development level guys, all need to be sailors for BNG. Yeah. And Navico, one of the more recent acquisitions, um, I think two to three years ago, you um, bought CMAP, and that's brought some very interesting features that can work across all of your brands. And um, what is that gonna bring for the future of BNG instruments? That's an excellent question. So CMAP is a, traditionally, it's a cartography company, mapping. Um, they were owned by Jefferson when we bought them, which was a Boeing company. So they have gone from being a very small marine company when they first started, they got bought by Boeing, and now they're back in the marine world. Um, so they may, might have had a little culture shock when we uh, brought them back into the fold as they don't need to do things quite in the Boeing way anymore. Um, but they are, CMAP have not just a lot of cartography skills, but a lot of data handling skills. So the way we look at CMAP is more as a digital arm of the company. Um, you'll have seen there's a CMAP Embark app, which is a, a general navigation app, which is free. You can download it, the charts stream for free. Um, if you want offline charts to use it without a data signal, you can purchase them on a subscription basis. Um, but what CMAP really gives us is, you know, we worked quite closely and still do work quite closely with Navionics. 
Um, Navionics is still compatible with all our products and we continue to use them quite a lot. Um, but with having a company in house that can do the same sort of thing, we can say, we want this chart to do this when we click on this. And we can have that discussion with an in-house team, just as it would be as if it was, when I calibrate my wind sensor, I want it to do this. We can sort of have those conversations on a very open level and explore possibilities without uh, effectively giving everybody who uses that chart the same feature. Um, so it's a little, it's nice to have a team like that in-house. They're super specialist. It's the only piece of Navico where we have what we call an end-to-end -end organization. So in BNG, we have uh, de pools development. We have specific developers that we generally always use in our projects, but they're from the overall pool of engineers. With CMAP, from sales through service, R&D, it's all in the CMAP world, and we don't do a lot of sharing between uh, Navico and CMAP because uh, creating a cartography product and creating a piece of hardware is quite a different thing and you need to have different specializations. So the CMAP guys all sit, mainly all sit, I shouldn't say they all sit, 90% of them sit in Massa in Italy um, to drive that piece of the business and it's a very focused approach. So we try, we've tried not to uh, pull them around too much while they're finding their feet within Navico. Um, but having the ability to tweak, you know, we always have this discussion, what is a chart? And to me, a chart is a UK Admiralty chart or an MRA chart, whichever is your personal preference, and they're the right colours for a chart. But then you go inland fishing in the US and they go, well, I want to see every one foot contour and I want to see what the bottom's made of. And if there's a pile of rocks over there, I want to know about it. Whereas if we're sailing, we just say, well, I know, want to know how deep the water is. I want to see what the tide is doing. But as long as I'm not physically going to hit anything, I don't really care if there's a rock 40 meters below me. It's not that important to me. I prefer the area was clear so I can put tactical overlays like ley lines on top. Um, so what is a chart is different whether you're a sailing guy or a cruising guy or a racing guy or a fishing guy or whatever it happens to be. Um, and that's quite an eye-opening uh, conversation when you actually get into it because what actually matters on the CMAP side is therefore the data and the delivery of that data and then the brand the B&G brand can choose how best to present that data for its sailing customers. One of, one of the interesting things I've got to embark on my phone and I've used it a bit is um, the visualizations and um, you, you talk there about the color coding of different areas and say you're in a yacht and it draws let's say two point two and a half meters yep and you want to say okay i'm sailing along i don't actually care how deep it is as long as it's not less than two and a half meters yep. or three meters if you're giving yourself a little bit of leeway and in the solent i often don't um but if if you want to just just display that information so that you're not getting in the way of your ley lines your tide charts and everything else is that all possible yeah, there's various features um, around that do that. One of the um, main features in the current CMAP charts is you can do what we call color shading. So you can actually change even down to incremental, you know, one to two meters, two to five meters, whatever. You could have a different color. Um, or there's safety depth where you can just say, as you say, below five meters, just make everything white because I'm good. I don't care too much about that anymore. Um, you know, it's I like that feature. I can see why some people like it to be fixed because if you jump from boat to boat, maybe you're a navigator and you sail on three different boats with three different types of charting or something like that, then it's nice to know that where the blue starts and the light blue starts is always two meters or five meters or whatever it is and it's consistent so you don't get your head wrapped around something. But the ability to change those things on your own boat is really useful, I find. And you know, in sailing, the only reason you care if it's a meter under your keel or 200 meters under your keel is because of the amount of current that's there, right? If you're not going to hit anything, it's just whether you're going forwards at one knot or backwards at one knot with the tide. So, yeah, there's some, uh, there's some nice things you can do around that. And the number of things we do with the overlays, uh, for ley lines, for ley line sectors and things like that, the less clutter you want on your chart and the less color you want on your chart because it actually 
adds confusion. So, you know, one of the challenges with what we do with cartography and with many features is actually what don't you put on the screen? Because if you put everything on the screen, you won't be able to understand any of it. And if you leave it to the consumer to decide, then they'll chop and change and put several different things on and you'll go, well, that doesn't really work because we didn't design it to work in that combination of features. And if you allow 10 different things where you can work out the number of possible combinations, right? There's so many to test that you just can't, you can allow them, but if someone finds a problem with it, you have to go, I didn't really design it to do that. <laughs> so it's uh, that's a hard call when you're developing a product is do you stop the consumer doing something with it? Or do you let them do it and understand that you haven't necessarily tested that particular one of 17,000 combinations of screens. So it's a difficult one, but um, certainly from a presentation point of view, usually less is more. I, I think, well, we've all used Google Maps and anybody who's used CMAP, in, CMAP Embark will see the, the familiarity, we come back to that yeah. word, um, of the two interfaces. And the first thing we all did when we got Google Maps was, oh, look, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And yeah. soon you've got a screen that is utterly unreadable. And then you pair it back to actually, ah, this is the one I want. This is what I want. And so, yes, I think setting up that base setting and then giving the options for everything else so that people can add in their own little tweaks and make yeah. it personal to them, really. And that's right. And I, I find the sailing community, especially, we like to tweak with stuff. <laughs> There's no question about it. And I'm as bad as anybody else. So that is certainly true. And with product development, um, while I know a lot of the features that you're developing are probably under wraps, um, what, it, what excites you most about what's maybe on the horizon that you can talk about? I can't talk about any of it. <laughs> However, the things that excite me the most, there's, there's two things I find exciting. One is improving the basics. So the new wind sensor we developed last year. To the uninitiated, it looks the same as the old wind sensor. You know, it has cups that spin around underneath. It's got a vane on the top. Um, but if you go through every single piece of that sensor, the, the only thing that's the same between that one and the previous one is one wind speed bearing and every single piece of it is very slightly better than the old one, which means that whereas the old one was 0.8 to 1.2 degrees accuracy, which 10 years ago when you were sailing non-planing boats and they went eight knots in every direction, and I'm probably talking 20 years ago, um, was fine. But now we're dealing with boats like the big offshore multi-hulls where the actual wind range for measured wind is something between about 25 degrees and 45 degrees. So if you have a one degree accuracy sensor there in that 20 degree range, then- 5% five, five accuracy. That's pretty poor, right? <laughs> and then you take that number and you calculate that through the boat speed and the heading and try and come back with a true wind direction. Suddenly you've got a big error. And there are also boats that are using autopilots. So you're steering to that wind angle. So, Little things like that, those iterative developments, I find very interesting because they're usually the ones that follow a process. You know, that one, the guy spent probably 10 to 12 days in the wind tunnel at Southampton University testing different products, different ideas for products and all those things. Um, and the other thing that I find really exciting is the software feature development. And that's because I think it's quick and you see results really quickly. You have an idea you get it in there, you go through the process and you get something that works and you can test really quickly. And that's always, you know, hardware development takes 12 to 24 months, depending on what sort of product it is. But software, you can turn around the prototype really quickly and get out on the water and test it and see if it's worth developing further. So I find that quite a, uh, a satisfying piece. You know, starting off a project now that you're not going to see something even in prototype form for nine to 15 months is a difficult one <laughs> but when you know you can see something in prototype form next week that's kind of nice and over 25 years at bng you must have seen a fair few iterations you want me to add them up <laughs> uh so in instruments 
I have seen, I think, nine different ranges, probably, just adding them up in my head. But yes, it's, um, and instruments are one of the slower terms. Um, you know, our instrument life cycle, ignoring software updates is probably something like six years, um, maybe more in some cases, maybe less in others. Whereas chart plotters and MFDs tend to be three or four years. Um, so yeah, I've seen quite a lot pass under the bridge, I guess. Don't feel old <laughs> yet. And, and so parallels, um, if you look at your sailing dinghies back in the day with the 4,000, yes, it had wings, but now a moth with wings, very different beasts. Different wings too. <laughs> Underwater wings rather than overwater wings. Yes. And even, I mean, it's odd. Even going from the 4,000 to the B14, which is actually, I think, an older design. Um, the B14 was naturally 20 kilos lighter and you took all the correction laid out of the 4,000, which was 18 to 24 kilos the weight we were. And suddenly you have a more powerful boat that's 40 kilos lighter. And that 40 kilos is more than my moth weighs by 10 kilos or so. So yeah, hugely different. Well, I, I can't really talk. Be carrying my boat into the water one day, right? Well, I can't really talk because at the time you were sailing the 4,000s, I was out in a 5,000 and that made the 4,000 look light. And that was certainly a heavy beast. <laughs> well, Alan, it's been fantastic to chat today and just hear about your journey inside B&G and also just seeing how the product has developed. So many thanks indeed for your time and stay safe. Thanks, Mark. Good to talk. There's not much else to do around here at the moment apart from work. Enjoy it then. Take care. Speak soon.